and the rigors of one final campaign. On the evening of July 21st, 1944, his name was placed in nomination for a fourth term at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Present to this convention for the office of President of these United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR did not accept the nomination in Washington. He was aboard his presidential train, the Ferdinand Magellan, in San Diego, California. Accompanied by his son Jimmy, he was en route to Hawaii for a meeting with General MacArthur about Pacific strategy. As he prepared to give his acceptance speech, his whole body suddenly contorted in pain. He suddenly turns to Jimmy and he said, my God, I have terrible pains. I don't know if I can go through this. He said, stretch me out on the floor, loosen everything, you know. He was pale. For 10 minutes, Jimmy could watch his father in terrible pain, thinking he's never going to be able to get up and get out of this. And then after a few minutes, he said, all right, now, let's get together if we have this broadcast to do. And he gave the broadcast. I have already indicated to you why I accept the nomination which you have offered me, in spite of my desire to retire to the quiet of private life. You in this convention aware of what I have sought to gain for the nation, and you have asked me to continue. But the Democratic Party bosses didn't want the Vice President Henry Wallace to continue. There was a fear among the delegates that although Roosevelt would win the election, he might well die in office. Wallace was considered soft on communism, on the far left of the party, and not a worthy successor to FDR. In the end, to avoid a floor fight, Missouri Senator Harry Truman became the compromise candidate for the vice presidency. Despite FDR's health problems, Truman was not brought into Roosevelt's confidence, nor was he told of the existence of the Manhattan Project. With the convention behind him, FDR continued his journey to Pearl Harbor. There, he met military leaders to discuss the Pacific War Strategy. The trip ended with a tour of a local hospital, and with the press kept away, he made a remarkably intimate disclosure. For a man like Roosevelt, who had tried so long and so hard to hide his paralysis from the American people, he knew when he went into the hospital and was visiting men who had had arms and legs removed, amputees, that if he were able to show them that he was in a wheelchair, it would give them a certain strength. Perhaps the reason why he didn't show himself so easily to other people was that he was afraid that if they saw this battle he was fighting with himself, that they would not feel that he was as strong a leader as he truly was, that too much of his energy was going to fighting this battle. But he won that battle magnificently. But in 1944, winning this battle of perception was paramount. As rumors about his health circulated, FDR knew he could not afford to be seen as a cripple. In the final election of FDR's life, his opponent was Thomas Dewey, the Republican governor of New York. The campaign was a testament to Roosevelt's courage and the public's willingness to be deceived. This is Judy Garland with a suggestion for tomorrow. Here's the way to win the war. Win the war. Win the war. Here's the way to win the war. You gotta get out and vote to get the things we're fighting for, fighting for, fighting for, to get the things we're fighting for, you gotta get out and vote. Oh, we want to have a better world, better world, better world, want to have a better world, you gotta get out and vote. Every public appearance involved excruciating pain, resulting in part from his doctor's insistence that during the last four stressful years, Roosevelt not carry the additional load of his nearly 10-pound braces. But for his fourth presidential election, FDR still felt he needed to put them back on to perpetuate the illusion of mobility. That was very hard because his knees had begun tightening up again. And it was exceedingly painful to have his legs straightened out in a brace. When he gave a campaign speech on braces in Washington State, Bremerton, he again had an angina attack but he continued to give the speech right through this incredible pain. The war is well in hand in the vast area, but I cannot tell you if I knew when the war will be over, either in Europe or in the Far East, or the war against Japan itself. 
As he had so many times before, Roosevelt became invigorated by the campaign. And when, in late October, his Republican opponent suggested he was an invalid confined to the White House, he undertook a tour of all five New York boroughs, a journey he refused to cancel, even when it coincided with an offshore hurricane. There were millions of people who turned out for him. And he was thoroughly soaked. The Secret Service had it worked out so that every hour, his limousine would pull into a garage and they would lift him out of the car, and put him on a pile of blankets, strip his clothes off, rub him with a towel, give him a shot of brandy, and then put new clothes on, put him back in the car, and then he'd continue. On camera, he was uh, jovial, but uh, off the camera, he was suffering, no doubt about it. So I tell you, it was about 12 hours of misery for us and I guess, I'm sure it was misery for him. He ended the day at Ebbets Field, where his radiant confidence was all the country needed as proof that he was fit for office. They saw what they wanted to see. He's healthy, he's got it, they all said after that, and that helped to ease the path to his reelection. On the final day of the campaign, he was back at Hyde Park, the place from which he had always drawn strength. FDR could savor his victory, finally take off his braces, and rest. But with 53% of the popular vote, it was his smallest margin of victory since he first won the presidency. Nevertheless, he had again convinced Americans that he was up to the job. But that didn't make it true. November 23rd, 1944. The president has lost 10 pounds in the last two to three months and is, I think, rather worried about it. He looked very thin today, and his aches and pains worry me. But what can I do? But FDR's confidant, Daisy Sukley, wasn't prepared to accept the inevitability of his decline. From Wilderstein, her home along the Hudson, 10 miles north of Hyde Park, she contacted Harry Sitaro, or Mr. Lenny, as he was known. He had once been a professional boxer and corner man for Joe Lewis, but in later life, he claimed to have found magical healing powers through intensive massage. Daisy not only told the president about him, but actually arranged secretly to have this massage therapist turn up at her home, Wildestein, when the president happened to be visiting, and allowed him to massage his legs and feet. December 27th, 1944. As soon as the Secret Service had gone out, Lenny got to work on the President's legs, right over his trousers and while he sat with his feet on the floor. After a while, he got the President to lie down on the sofa and took off his shoes and stockings, began to work on the feet. Suddenly, he looked up at the President with a smile and said, President, you're going to walk. I am full of hope for him, through the hands of Lenny, who says he is just a tool of God. The amazing thing is that Roosevelt seems really to have believed that maybe finally he'd found someone who could actually help him get back on his feet again. Now, this is a man who's dying. He is not going to get back on his feet again. But he, he suddenly locked his, his, his optimism on this fellow named Lenny, a, a sort of semi-literate, untrained uh, mystery man. For almost 25 years, Roosevelt had never given up the hope that someday he would walk again. But there would be no miracles, no improvement that lasted beyond a fleeting rush of adrenaline. I remember my mother told me a very interesting story of Pa asking her to come to his bedroom at a particular time because he, Daisy Sookley had persuaded him to see man, Mr. Lenny, I think his name was, to that his hands were miraculous and so forth. And that my mother just commented, well, another one, uh, but Pa will not give up. Roosevelt was exhausted, but there was no time for rest. Ahead lay another conference with Stalin, this one at Yalta in the Crimea, a 10-day journey across the Atlantic in the dead of winter. <laughs> 